Are you tired of advertisements? You can listen to this episode and more ad-free for only $1 a month by supporting the show on Patreon. Visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and hit the Patreon tab for more details. Good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I'm your guide, Derek Hayes. Folks, I'm so happy to have you back for tonight's second installment of the Hometown Legends season finale special. Now, I hope you enjoyed the first part as much as I did producing it. All sorts of calls from all over the country. And so many new subjects to cover. I just might be enjoying it just a little more than you, to be honest. And tonight just might be better. You guys know how this works. Tonight's season finale special is a Hometown Legends episode, meaning these calls feature and discuss local stories, tales, and legends. Famous haunted spots, hidden treasure, murder houses, that sort of thing. Remember, by nature, many of these calls tend to involve assault, death, murder, and suicide. So let this be your trigger warning. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get right back into it. Beginning in Northern California. Carrie, welcome to tonight's program. Hi, uh, Derek. This is Carrie from Humboldt County, California, and I'm calling in for your Hometown Legend special. I live about an hour away from where the Patterson Gimli film was made, and the river that it takes place by is called the Trinity River. And there's a legend about them with the Hoopa tribe here locally that there are river protectors that protect the river until it is ready to swim. So every year they say that at least two or three people pass away in the river to appease the river protectors. And after July 1st or after the third person has died, unfortunately it is safe to swim after that. And it has been that way for a couple of years there's at least two or three people that do go swimming and get you know caught up in the you know current and everything and they end up passing away um so i looked into it a little bit more and there's a couple of different names for it Um, it is advised not to say its name next to the river but there's tamos and us as Pusun Sarah, I, I'm probably not saying that right at all, but um, some people believe that if you feed it before you go swimming, like you float a cheeseburger on a wrapper down the waves or you throw some sort of food into the river for it, that it will be appeased and it will not take your life. I did find a, another story about it and about how somebody was swimming too early and while they were swimming they started hearing beautiful melody coming from below the water and so they tried to swim to find the melody and found a woman under the water and then tried to swim to save the woman and then she ended up disappearing and he wound up about a mile downstream somewhere where he wasn't supposed to because he got swept away in the current. So, yeah, that is our local Trinity River, and uh, hopefully 
it stays appeased and people will learn to feed it. But it's unfortunate that it does, two or three people do happen to die every year in the river. Uh, so yeah, that is my local hometown legend and I hope you guys enjoy it. Good job keeping the show going and I really enjoy it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Carrie. All sorts of lore seeping out of that area. As Carrie mentioned, river spirits, Bigfoot, a few other things. And although she didn't mention it, a little known cryptid that I've been fascinated with for years. They call it the Trinity Alps Salamander. The giant salamander of California's Trinity Alps have been reported for more than seven decades. Frank L. Griffith was one of the first modern witnesses. During the 1920s, Griffith was hunting deer near the head of the Trinity Alps New River. At the bottom of the lake there, Griffith spotted five salamanders, ranging from five to nine feet long. He caught one on a hook, but he could not pull it out of the river. After hearing the story of Griffith's giant salamanders, biologist Thomas L. Rogers made four unsuccessful trips in 1948 to try to locate the animals. Now that excerpt was from the book Cryptozoology A to Z, the encyclopedia of lock monsters, Sasquatch, Chupacabras, and other authentic mysteries of nature by Lauren Coleman and Jerome Clark. And those 1948 expeditions were not the only endeavors made to try to locate these elusive subaquatic giants. Folks have tried in 48, 58, 59, 60, 97, 2021, and there is a new one slated for 2025, an expedition that you can actually fund over on Kickstarter. A link to the last two can be found in tonight's show notes. The others are all outlined in Coleman and Clark's paperback. Now this legend has always excited me, because the thought of alligator-sized salamanders lurking the icy cold waters of Northern California was just too cool to pass up. And given how remote a lot of that area is, and how so few people go up into those areas, it's entirely possible that something could survive up there, undetected. Especially once you learn that a creature that fits that exact description already seems to exist. Folks in parts of Japan and China have already proven the existence of their giant salamander. The Japanese giant salamanders can grow up to 5 feet in length and weigh 36 kilograms. That's 80 pounds. Known in Japanese as the Osan Shō or pepperfish, this salamander is entirely aquatic and nocturnal. Look at that. During the day, these shy creatures burrow into the riverbanks to hide. It's a relic of the species. This animal has hardly changed for the past 20 million years. Judging by its ancient appearance, that's not hard to believe. Authorities have outlawed hunting the creature but its habitat is still at risk. Now that clip on behalf of Nat Geo. And look, the terrain in which these things survive over there in Asia is awfully similar to the habitat the Trinity Alps giant salamander is said to inhabit, making their existence even more of a possibility. And if these things are strictly nocturnal, and burrow into the river's banks. Makes that possibility even more feasible. And while that might seem like a neat little notion, just know they do occasionally attack humans, especially when provoked. And while they're not known to kill anyone, I imagine their teeth-lined jaws would go a long way to ruin your picnic. Now, I know that creature wasn't covered in your call, but thank you, Carrie, for bringing up this region. Like I said, I've been fascinated with this creature for a long time. It was fun to finally explore it. I have no regrets. Now, folks, if you have a tale to tell, a true tale, call our hotline at 888-608-NIGHT. 
That's 888-608-NIGHT. And don't forget, you can also send a recorded voice message via email. Monsters Among Us Podcast at gmail.com. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to make our way down to Texas, where an OG listener is waiting with an entry. Hey, Derek, repeat offender and OG MABU Patreon. I say OG because now that you've changed the price, all of us that are paying the original price can call ourselves the OGs. So there you go. And just have a little hometown legend for you. Actually, maybe a couple of them. There is a state park in uh, the Lano County area called Enchanted Rock. I grew up in very rural Lano County in the middle, very middle of Texas. And uh, but Enchanted Rock is a very cool place. It's one of the biggest domes, uh, granite domes in the United States. But the story is that the Indians, Native Americans, Um, And that area, way back when, had thought that that rock was haunted. They continued to hear um, voices, they said. They continued to hear different things. They thought it was sacred. Some thought it was haunted, etc. And so stories go, like, if if cowboys would come into that area and they would start getting chased by these Indians, then they would go up on this rock and hide because the Native Americans would not come up there because they felt it was haunted. Uh, haunted by supposedly a Native American warrior chief that would chase you off the mountain. Now, the mountain itself is very, very, very steep, and it's a granite dome, so very, very slick. So it's very, very dangerous if you are up there in the wrong time. And so they thought that this Native American warrior would chase you off there and make you plummet to your demise. So that's the story. And that, again, that's in Lano County, Texas. Another little tidbit is a buddy of mine has access to a private ranch right around there. There is another mountain called House Mountain, and the story behind it is very similar to the Marfa Lights, in that there was a house on top of this mountain. Uh, it was right nestled in, in Native American territory, and they decided to attack this house whenever the husband was away, and they murdered the wife and the children uh, in just very unfortunate circumstance. So the story is that you can still see lights going up there, and that's the husband still looking for the wife and the kids. And if you ever get into the Austin or San Antonio area, let me know. And maybe I can get you up on that mountain. Maybe we can look at those lights. So anyway, man, thanks. Appreciate it. Great job as always. And talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you, caller. Both for the support and the phone call. Now, folks, this entry reminds me of Skull Valley up there in Utah. A hometown legend we talked about in last week's part one. And it also reminds me of an area close to me here in Southern California, the Lucerne Valley. It's a desolate area and a few people live in, a few dozen miles east of here, down in the desert. Now, I've had several reports come out of that barren place as well. And as interesting as all this is, it sounds like these little strange pockets are littered all over the country. Perhaps there's just something about these wide open spaces with small populations. Well, either way, I'm glad that you called and told us about yours, caller. And thank you again for calling in. Now, folks, this next one takes us out of the country and back up to Canada. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas to the program. Hi Derek, my name is Nicholas and I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. For those in the USA who are unfamiliar, it's the province north of Minnesota and North Dakota. My hometown legend is about a national historic site and active hotel in Winnipeg called the Fort Garry Hotel. The hotel is a 110 year old Chateau style hotel which has served musicians, artists and royalty since it was built and is still a gorgeous hotel to this day. It also has a reputation for its hauntings. The most haunted section is room 202, where about 80 to 90 years ago, a woman hanged herself in her closet after learning of her husband's death in a car wreck. It is frequently reported by guests and staff that blood will run down the walls in the room and people will feel someone climbing into bed with them, including reports of this by a member of parliament in 2004. A full-bodied apparition of the woman is also seen, albeit rarely, 
and she is known to hover at the foot of the bed, about a foot off the ground, as if she was still hanging. Cameras and audio-visual equipment uh, are also known to fail in room 202, so as far as I know, no photos or EVPs exist in that room. That said, anyone listening to this call has anything, I'm sure all of us would love to see it. Uh, reservations of room 202 are booked years in advance for ghost tours, so if you want an inn, uh, you better book now. Lesser known ghosts are a young woman in late Victorian dress wandering the corridors at night and a ghost of a man dining by himself long after the dining rooms are closed for the evening. Voices can also be heard in the seventh floor ballrooms called the Crystal Ballroom and the Concert Hall Ballroom when nobody else is present. The hotel is a gorgeous building with a tremendous history and is a local landmark in a very spiritually and historically charged area. Uh, the local indigenous tribes, the Dene, the Cree, the Ojibwe, uh, just as examples, have used the forks of the Assiniboine and the Red Rivers, where the hotel now sits for six millennia as a trading and holy place. Uh, the host hell also sits atop the ruins of Upper Fort Gary, which is an old Hudson Bay Company fort, which was built in 1822, and whose palisade and main gate remain just outside the hotel lobby. All this saying, Winnipeg itself is an old city by North American standards. There's been indigenous settlements here for over 6,000 years, and there's a, been a permanent European presence since 1738. There's lots of other ghost stories in the area, uh, for example, at the jail downtown. But that's stories for another day. I recommend looking up the ghosts in the area. Uh, and taking a look at the hotel itself, you can get an idea of what the area looks like and what the hotel itself looks like. There's pictures all over the internet. That's all for now, uh, but that's my hometown legend about the Fork Area Hotel. I hope you can find this useful for hometown legends. Uh, have a nice day. You know, Nicholas is right. It is a beautiful hotel. Sort of reminds me of something Kevin McAllister might have stayed in. Circa 1992. And I know Winnipeg is pretty far away. And unless corporate is going to fly you up there for a sales pitch, you're likely not going to make it up that way for a tour. Unless, of course, you live near there or something. The point being is that I found the next best thing. A tour of room 202, courtesy of a news reporter named Clay Young from Global News. There's a link in the show notes if you'd like to lay eyes on this modestly haunted abode. But, for those of you that won't, I thought it'd be cool to share a first-hand account from this particular room of the Fort Gary Hotel. This was an experience told by Mr. Young in the aforementioned clip. Well, I, I will give you a true story. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, last year at, yeah. at Halloween. Yeah. Uh, this was a story for CJOB, and I, you graciously allowed us to yeah. stay the night. Mm -hmm. And my wife said, I'm all in on this. So I had to get up and do the morning show the next day. I got to get up at 3.30. I'm sound asleep, and it's about 1 o'clock in the morning. She's waking me up going, hey, 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 what, yeah. what, what? Yeah. And that door, yes. the bathroom door right here, yes. was, okay. it was it was already like this, but it was starting to move. And I'm like, what? And, it's, and then it stopped about right there. And of course, I couldn't go back to sleep, mm -hmm. but I had to do the morning show, so I left you here at around 3. Where do you think you're going? <laughs> Got to go to work. You're not leaving me alone here, are you? Good luck. Goodbye. And it sounds like this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to activity in and around the hotel there. So a huge thanks to you, Nicholas, for bringing all of this to our attention. Folks, let's talk about microdosing. I've been singing its praises for a while now because I feel there are so many benefits to it. Tonight's sponsor, Microdose Gummies. Help me with anxiety, insomnia, and even back pain. Microdose gummies deliver the perfect entry-level dose of THC that help you feel just the right amount of good. You know that feeling when you're just kind of chilled out. Your body and your mind are at peace. Maybe you just finished a great workout or a nice relaxing shower. Well, that's a good way to explain how microdosing can make you feel. But I'm not talking about getting quote-unquote high. 
I'm talking about the sweet spot between CBD and THC that gives you the benefits of both. Now, most of the time, I like to take microdose gummies at night to help me wind down and get ready for bed. They help me chill out and stop feeling anxious about all the things I have to do the next day. So what are you waiting for? Get 30% off your first order plus free shipping today at microdose.com with the promo code Monsters Among Us. It's available nationwide. That's microdose.com promo code Monsters Among Us for 30% off and free shipping. Microdose.com promo code Monsters Among Us. Now, as always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening. And back to that person that looks exactly like you do. And bot territory. Now, folks, we're going to lead off this next group of calls with a trip to wild, wonderful West Virginia. Todd, welcome to the season finale. Hello, Derek. This is Todd from West Virginia, and this is a story for your next Hometown Legends episode. In Huntington, West Virginia, there is the legend of the Ghost of Fifth Street Hill. Everyone in Huntington knows someone or knows someone who knows someone who has experienced this haunting. So it goes. Fifth Street Hill is a stretch of road on State Route 152 in between the city of Huntington and Out Wayne County. The legend goes that as you drive along the hill section of Fifth Street Hill after midnight on a rainy summer night, an apparition of a young woman will appear on the side of the road. She will be dressed in all white, soaking wet, and thumbing for a ride. If you stop to pick her up, she will thank you, but say very little else. And before you reach the top or bottom of the hill, depending on which direction you are going, she will disappear, simply vanishing from the back of your car. Usually, no trace is left behind, but in some accounts, she leaves a pool or puddle of water on your seat or floorboard. The first published account of this tale was in a newspaper article in the 1940s, I believe. A cab driver reported that he had picked up a young woman on his way back into Huntington in the pouring rain. She asked to be dropped off at the bottom of the hill, and when they arrived, the driver noticed the woman was missing from his cab. Later on, he told his boss what had happened, and his boss said that other drivers had experienced the same thing. So, I have a friend who, for the sake of staying anonymous, I will call Bob. I've been friends with Bob since middle school, and Bob has told me this story ever since it happened, and he has maintained its validity for all these years. This happened in the summer between our 11th and 12th grade years, which would have been in 2001. Bob was driving home to Huntington after visiting with his girlfriend at the time, who lived in the smaller town of Lavalette along State Route 152. Just as he crested the hill heading down into Huntington, he saw her on the side of the road, thumbing for a ride, and dressed all in white. He said it wasn't raining, but had been just prior, so he was already going slower than normal. When he saw her, he slowed even more, and he said that he got a really weird, off kind of vibe from her, and said that he noticed she wasn't looking at his car at all just kind of blankly staring off. He kept driving. He had no intentions of stopping. But a few seconds later, he checked in his rear view mirror just to look at her again, and she was gone. Vanished. Just nowhere to be seen. He immediately went home, and it left such an impression on him that still, to this day, he will not drive that stretch of road at night. So that is my story of the ghost of Fifth Street Hill in Huntington, West Virginia. I absolutely love your show, and I send all of my thanks to you and your team. I just signed up for Patreon at the end of 2023, and I plan to send in more stories in the future. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Todd. That's one of those classic ghost stories. The Phantom Hitchhiker, as it's better known very similar to other countless legends covered over the years. Resurrection Mary, Lady Bend Hill, and to a certain extent, La Llorona. 
Now, I admittedly did not know about this haunting ahead of time, but I'm pretty sure that I've been through that area a good while back. On my way to a Marshall versus West Virginia football game, I believe. It's an area steeped in legend and tragedy, and that makes all of this that much more believable. And I'll keep my eyes open when I make it back down that way. And thanks again, Todd, for sharing that entry. Now for this next call, we travel across the country to the Southern Californian coast. Matt, let's hear your hometown legend. Hey Derek, this is Matt, and I've got a story for your hometown legends. I live in LA. This hometown legend takes place not too far from my hometown. It doesn't take place in LA, but it's further up in the Ventura Oxnard area. Specifically, it deals with uh, what is now a university called Cal State Channel Islands. Now, I didn't go there, but one of my best friends went there. And uh, back when the school actually had just opened back in like the, I want to say, late 2010s or early 2010s, somewhere around there, he was one of the first uh, classes to to go there, one of the first groups of uh, students to attend. And we would go up and visit, and this is kind of where I learned about all this stuff. And it's always stuck with me because it was just so wild, and I've never really heard about it in any other place. And I wanted to share it here. So that school is kind of tucked away in this strange little pocket of mountains. In fact, uh, there are these three little hill mountains and at the bottom of this little kind of dip valley is the school. But the school wasn't always a school. It used to be a, I want to I try to be respectful here and not use the word, you know, I'm gonna say a mental institution. I know that's kind of out. I don't really want to say that. I'd like to say a, a center for, you know, treating people who are suffering from mental illness. And before it was that, it was an ancient site to the, uh, local Native American tribes, they saw that place as a, as a place of healing. I know I'm kind of going back and forth in the story here, but if you start with that, the Native Americans saw this place as a sacred site, and it was a place they would go to improve their overall health for whatever reason, like retreats almost. The reason it was sacred to them was because of those hills that I mentioned. There are three hills, there are three little mountains that are apparently perfectly aligned in some geometry where it's like a perfect triangle. They're the same exact height. They're the same exact distance apart. And in the exact center of that is where the sacred site is, which was later the, the place to treat people who were suffering from mental illness, and then later the school. Well, you know, time passes and civilization shows up. And the reason that it was and became a center to treat people with mental illness was because the people who decided to build it there knew the history of the area and they knew that it was seen always as a place to improve people's healing and so that place was built there and it was in operation for years and years and years in fact i think it closed in like the late 90s and then it just lay abandoned there forever well the state ended up getting it and they turned it into a school and they actually tore down some of the existing buildings and then repurposed others and added on and turned it into Cal State Channel Islands. And when my buddy was going there, what was really weird was, you know, some of the buildings were, were empty and abandoned and people were going to go on ghost hunting and stuff, you know, looking for the ghosts of crazy people or whatever. But uh, there were there were buildings there that had been uh, definitely repurposed. You could tell, like, for example, the art building. I remember he was walking us by it and it was like the children's ward. And there are all these creepy murals on the wall. And in fact, there was a big op high set window. There were a bunch of uh, canisters of empty medication, and all those orange ones you get from the pharmacy. And those were just lined up against the windowsill, and each of them was were paintbrushes that had been drying. So it was just this kind of weird vibe where it was this mesh of definitely this place is, was not a school, and now it is a school. And the kicker for the story is my buddy's roommate was this incredibly smart guy he was from india he was doing pre-med and he had a full ride and uh wherever he wanted to go he got accepted to every school in the country in the u.s and he chose cal state channel islands i mean this little tiny school over here on the west coast not i mean it's a good school but it's not like it's a stanford or a ucla in terms of clout he chose that school because he knew the history of those mountains and he knew the history of the area and it was seen as a sacred place 
And so he chose to go there of all the places he could have gone. Anyway, that's it. Definitely worth diving into on your end and checking it out. Uh, Cal State Channel Islands and that whole area has a very kind of weird history. Um, and, uh, you know, not nothing supernatural, but I guess there is in a sense when you consider that the place is history with Native Americans. Thank you, Matt. Now, I'll be up that way later this year. We're putting the finishing touches on a camping trip that would take us on a ferry across the water to the Channel Islands National Park. As much as I hate being on water, I'm really looking forward to that trip. Now this story was brand new to me, so I did a little digging around and all of Matt's claims are correct. Not that we didn't believe him. But it seems almost unbelievable that there used to be a mental institution up in that area. It's honestly a beautiful spot in a very expensive area. And if you haven't visited through there, and don't think you will, I happen to have the next best thing. A helicopter tour courtesy of KCAL, CBS News 9, out of Los Angeles. Well, take a look at this beautiful university campus in Ventura County. This is Cal State Channel Islands, nestled at the easternmost point of the Oxnard Plain and the westernmost point of the Santa Monica Mountains. This university celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, opened in 2002. But these buildings are a lot older than that, most of them anyway, because this was originally built in the Great Depression as part of the New Deal and opened as Camarillo State Mental Hospital. So this was a mental hospital for more than 60 years, at one point serving more than 7,000 people when it peaked in the 1950s. But as costs rose and the population declined, uh, it just became too expensive. And so the mental hospital was turned over to the state and local systems. And a plan was developed to turn this beautiful area into a world-class university. And that's how we have Cal State Channel Islands. A lot of these buildings are the original ones and built in the uh, Mission Revival and Spanish style. And just absolutely beautiful and so much history to this area. And there's a lot of ghost stories to this area as well, as you can imagine being a formal mental hospital. Lots of accounts from students of uh, folks screaming when there's nobody around, doors slamming, banging on windows uh, when they're all alone. And there's an area way back in here that is called Scary Dairy that is part of the University Park. But look at this. It, it definitely looks haunted. A link to that clip can be found in the show notes at monstersamonguspodcast.com and by clicking the show notes tab. Now you might have caught the mention of Scary Dairy, a location that was discussed when Allie Terry of Let's Get Haunted joined me on episode 25 of season 15. We briefly discussed that infamously haunted location on that special episode. And I think I'll try to visit this location next time I'm driving through that way. If not for the architecture and ghost stories, then for the healing abilities it supposedly has. Until then, thanks again, Matt, for introducing us to the mysteries of campus. Now, folks, before I push play on this next hometown legend, a quick reminder that you can find all sorts of MAU gear over at our merch shop, monstersamonguspodcast.com forward slash shop and we have a new item alert a brand new poster design featuring the infamous mirrored men courtesy of artist Caitlin Gravenstein now these posters are much different than our past designs but no less amazing and spooky so head on over to the shop and take a look and don't forget that a portion of the sales from all of our Monsters Among Us posters goes to support the Navajo Water Project, which works across three states to provide clean running water to Navajo families. Now, on to that next entry. A call from Scott in parts unknown. Hi, Derek. My name's Scott. And I'm calling about a hometown legend from the 1980s. I was born and raised in Turlock, California, which is smack dab in the middle of the Central Valley, which is full of farms and back then many creepy abandoned farmhouses. When I was a sophomore in high school, I heard some older kids and 
class talking about a local legendary house out in the country called Hell House. It was supposedly some scary boarded up house that teenagers had been exploring since the 70s. The legend they relayed was that a woman had murdered her children and then her killed herself on the bed with a knife and supposedly the bloodstained bed was still in the house. Well, I had to wait till my older best friend got his license to get a look at it. We drove out on a bright Saturday and took a look. It sat behind a tall, sturdy wire fence on a dead-end country road with no other houses around. It was a tall, two-story, boarded-up, scary-looking house right out of a Stephen King novel. It was weathered almost to the color of black and exuded evil, even in the daytime. Well, we didn't go into it that day, but on many Friday and Saturday nights, we'd head out there and mess around and hang out with other bored high school kids with nothing to do. I never saw anybody go inside due to it being boarded up tightly until one time around back, we saw that a, a board was missing off of what looked like a kitchen window. So it was me and two other friends, and we climbed up and went inside with nothing other than a weak flashlight. There was nothing but trash on the ground floor, and we explored around until we found a stairwell inside a closed door, which we thought was creepy. Well, the stairs wound up to the top floor where we found it, that at least part of the legend was true. There was a large wrought iron bed with what appeared to be dried blood stains on the mattress. We didn't see any ghosts or weirdness, at least on that night. Another time we went out there with three friends and I was in the back seat and we drove past the house and turned around at the dead end and circled back. There'd been another car ahead of us and it parked right in front of the house. So we decided to keep going since there was already somebody there. As we passed the parked car, we saw nobody inside. My friend hit the brakes and put it in reverse and said he wanted to see where the driver was. I looked out the back window and the reverse lights lit up the car as we got close. Suddenly a man popped up in the driver's seat and his eyes were glowing gold and his face looked like a silent scream. We all screamed and immediately raced away, never really knowing exactly what we witnessed. It was about three, four years later that somebody actually bought the house and moved it about a mile away. And uh, the local newspaper had a headline that said something like, local haunted house purchased and moved to new location. I remember my dad asking me if uh, I knew about it. And I just looked at him and said, no, I never heard of that. I wish I'd saved the article. Anyway, less than a year later, we drove out to see it in its new location and it was gone. It had burned to the ground and I never knew what happened. It was just a, a foundation. After initially exploring the place, we went on to explore many more abandoned houses, but Hell House was always the gold standard. I wish it was still there, and I wish I'd taken photos of it. Thanks for hearing my entry. Thank you, Scott. Now, this is reminiscent of a mini hometown legend from my college days. I attended Bowling Green State University in northwest Ohio during the first half of the aughts. And one of the biggest legends around campus especially among paranormal circles, if there were such a thing at the time, was an abandoned house on the outskirts of town that we called the Potter House. It was an old green wooden house on a little hill just outside of town, silhouetted by the distant lights of Toledo. The place looked like your classic haunted house. Now, the house was decrepit and in all states of disrepair. And high school and college kids alike would go there and dare each other to venture inside. And I was one of those. I explored the house a few times in the summer of 2003. Now, I don't spook easily, but that place put my hair on end. Well, some idiots burned it to the ground not long after that. So now just the barn remains to this day. And the terrifying history of the house. The supposed location of a family murder. Well, that all seemed to be made up from what I can tell. And if I'm honest, it was pretty vague to begin with. So I suppose that should have been a sign. But the tales of murder, multiple deaths, and suicide all seem to have been fabricated. But that didn't stop the place from being creepy as hell. But while I'm back at my alma mater, let me tell you about another infamous haunting that was a little closer to home. 
for years. The girls at the Chi Omega sorority house claimed to have a ghost roaming their halls. The spirit, a former house sister, Amanda, haunts the Chi Omega sorority house there on campus and even today has become a major tradition for the ladies of Chi Omega. Now, while the details of the story have changed slightly over the years, one thing is for certain that Amanda was a sister of the Greek house who had long wanted to join a sorority. One night, some say during a very intense hazing event, there was an accident involving a moving train, and Amanda was tragically killed. However, it seems that she wanted to join the sorority so badly that even after her death, she seemed to stick around. Now today, in the house is a room with a small sign that says Amanda's room. The room is thought to have been the woman's room while she was still alive. Now according to the stories, Amanda still feels like part of the family and doesn't let anyone forget it. Besides stealing and moving the occasional objects, the ghost has also become a tradition for the house. Each year, the women make a composite photo of all the girls in the house that year. And on each composite, a blank space is left for Amanda. Now one year, the class of 87, they did not follow this tradition. And the photo, almost routinely, ends up on the floor. Possibly knocked down by the invisible hand of an angry spirit who just wants to be accepted by the girls of Chi Omega. Now I actually have a little bit of inside scoop on this supposed haunting. I was actually in the Greek system when I was in school there. And I knew a few of the ladies from Chi Omega. And despite my better judgment, I did ask them about the rumors of paranormal activity. And frankly, it seemed like they had zero interest in discussing that subject. But for a couple of summers, I worked on a paint crew for the school. A group of us would tackle various dorm rooms in Greek housing, giving each room a new coat of paint. And one July, I spent a few days in that sorority house alone. Now, I can't say for a fact that it is haunted, but I can say for a fact that the members of Chi Omega still leave a composite space open for Amanda each and every semester. All the numbers have changed. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. What is the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour in your day? I always feel like I'm racing against the clock, and I know a lot of you probably feel the same. But the thing is, what do we really need extra time for? If time was unlimited, how would you spend it? The first thing you have to do is identify what's really important to you. Then, make it a priority. Therapy can help you figure that out. Therapy has given me a chance to slow down and check in with myself. Something we don't always do in the chaos of our hectic schedules. It helps me feel more grounded. Now, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, which makes it convenient, flexible, and affordable. Just fill out a quick questionnaire to be matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Monsters Among Us today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash monsters among us now as always supporting our sponsor supports the show so thank you for listening now back to that bright flash in the sky
Now that song is a Sasquatch made of gold by the day jobs. And you can check out the full version of this one by clicking the link in the show notes. Now speaking of the big fella, maybe it's time we explore a legendary upright hominid. Elena from North Carolina. Welcome to the show. Hey, Derek, this is Elena calling again from North Carolina. This is for your hometown legends podcast. I just wanted to call and kind of give you information about the Bigfoot that lives in Shelby, North Carolina. I am from Shelby and growing up, it was always just about Nobby. So Nobby is our Bigfoot. It's in Shelby and surrounding areas, literally like the most like podunkiest town, but also kind of nice, but like not. You go like 15 miles down the road, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, like down some country road. You're in Kayser, Popeville. There's so many just little Lawndale, so many little random towns, okay? And he is just is around. People have seen him uh, in the 70s. Someone called 911 because a 10-foot tall hairy man was killing his dogs. And then there was a sighting in 2010, and you can look up the video, Shelby, North Carolina, Nobby sighting, and it is, it's embarrassing. Like, it seems like a joke, but people believe it. I mean, there's a Nobby sculpture down in Uptown Shelby. He's kind of like a superhero, famous figure in Shelby and surrounding areas. Anyways, I love your show. Just wanted to call, kind of talk about Nobby, because he's important. Anyways, bye. Thank you, Elena, for calling in. Old Nobby. I guess he gets that name on account that he'd been seen around the Carpenter's Knob area, just north of Kings Mountain. And as Elena mentioned, Nobby was a big deal in the 70s and 80s. In fact, two separate television programs were made about the beast. Admittedly, one better than the other. In my humble opinion... Now I've linked to each of those mini documentaries so you can contrast and compare. But for those that won't, the one that I liked better, the one produced and released in the early 80s, opened with these first-hand accounts of the knobby creature. Oh my lord. Well, I I had never seen that knobby in my life. It could be a big foot, like they say. It's not uncommon for it to have been uh, seen or heard here in, in the southeast. Hey, it was real dark black, just as black as it could be. Well, I'd say it weighed 250 pounds. Yeah, about six foot on its high. When it started to move, that's when I got out of here. It just flat-faced. It scared me half to death. I come home told my husband I was just seeing a monster. Does this creature exist? Is this what the folks of Carpenter's Knob are seeing? Whatever the creature of Carpenter's Knob may be, it is not nameless. The folks call it Knobby. And more than a few are asking, is Knobby the North Carolina Bigfoot? Now the other short TV special, dated 1979, is more like a docudrama or something. Full of bad acting and bad camera work. Now again, I've linked to each of these in tonight's show notes. And I can tell you that they're at least worth scrubbing through. Good work, Delaney, on digging those up. Oh, and she also uncovered one of the few songs written by Old Nobby. This one called Nobby's Lament by John Latham. And it goes something like this. Well, I've been running around this mountain feeling kind of low. Seems like everyone that sees me wants me in a circus show. Well, I guess I'm none too lovely, but what's a guy to do? If I come down off this mountain, they'll put me in a zoo. They call me Nobby, but I've got other names. They call me Nobby, but I never look the same. Well, here's the talk I've been around on every mountain. And folks, that's what they call a banger. Thank you again, Elena, for telling us about your hometown monster. 
Well, we've already discussed a couple of haunted places of learning here this evening. So why not make it a trifecta? Thanks to this story about another spooky school from Vi in California. Hi, Derek. This is Vi. I'm calling for a hometown legend. I'm from Lamar, California, but I live in Fresno now. It's about a half an hour, 45 minute drive away. The story takes place in the spring, I believe, of 2010. I was a sophomore in high school, and I was part of a drama class, and sometimes on the weekends we would do uh, competitions at other schools for all the different drama classes and stuff up and down the Central Valley. And this happened to take place at my high school. And Lamar High School was freaking haunted. In the auditorium, which is in the English building, we also have our drama classroom there in the same hallway. And me and my friend, Sarah, we were on a a break, and we were just hanging out in that English building, pretending to make a scary movie. And since it was a weekend, not all the lights were on in this building especially in the middle of the hallways. So we were just running up and down the hallways in an empty building, and not everything was supposed to be working. It's also a two-story building. So we went up the stairs and were messing around, laughing, thinking it was (laughs) the greatest time, and we heard a creak. So we turn and we look at, the elevator that's there by the back door of the auditorium backstage. And before we knew it, it was opening and closing. The lights were flickering. It was creaking, and it freaked us out. So we screamed and ran downstairs. I guess the door opened on that first floor, and it was so freaking scary. We laughed about it and then walked out and a bunch of our other friends were coming back from their competitions. So we walked back into the building and it turns out that the elevator was open on the bottom floor. So for some reason, one of us got a great idea to get into this uh, elevator, which is only supposed to fit maybe one or two people, fairly small box. And I was the person pressing the button by the door and the door seemed to want to close, and it only stopped where I was standing, and it swung back open, and I was kind of like, nope, and only to find out that there was a janitor, I guess, that hung himself in the auditorium just on the other side of this elevator. The whole auditorium is pretty creepy. The building was built in 1901. It's when that high school was even opened And it turns out that this building um, wasn't originally supposed to be there. There's a palm tree on the other side of town that was over by where my parents lived at the time that was supposed to be the original location for this high school. The original building was going to be on the further north side of town. And it turns out that they turned that into more farmland. And I think the town was built right towards the edge of Tulare Lake. Don't really quote me on that, but I don't remember the entire history of Tulare Lake, but it did go pretty far up near where Hanford and Lamore and Fresno all were. So I guess that's more research that I need to get into myself, but it'd be great to hear some feedback on that. Thank you for your time, and thank you, everybody, that make this podcast a thing. It's great to hear other people's stories and be able to share my own. So, thanks. Bye. Thank you, Vi. You know, that sounds like a lot of activity. But then again, that's par for the course with schools, in my opinion. At least, schools at night and off hours. You see, during the day, most of the time, nothing unusual is perceived there. Tons of faculty and students roaming the halls and filling the classrooms. But at night, and on those off hours, that energy seems to shift. 
making the list of schools with reported paranormal activity miles long. So Vi, I'm not surprised at all that your alma mater is no different. But I do thank you for sharing your hometown legend. Now folks, it finally happened. Our film, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Borrego Triangle, has finally released. Search for it on Apple TV, Amazon Prime, or a whole host of other streaming services. Or visit us at borregotriangle.com to learn more. Now I have a couple quick announcements regarding the film. First, I've heard your cry from places afar. And we are working on getting distribution to the UK and Australia and maybe a couple of other places. So please, just sit tight. Now, if you're a Kickstarter backer, we've already sent out your digital screeners. Look for those in your email. As far as rewards are concerned, we're getting those out this week. And we have a few people with unconfirmed addresses. So please, reference the Kickstarter page, or check your email for a confirmation. We're doing our best to get all of these rewards mailed out by the end of this week. And we thank you all for your patience and your support while we do so. But above all else, go check out the film. We can't wait for you to see it. Now, for something I would like to see. The Pig Man. To get us close, please welcome Cody from the state of Alabama. Hello, Derek and Monsters Among Us listeners. My name is Cody, and I'd like to talk about a cryptid from my area called Pigman. Now, I grew up in Chambers County, Alabama, in a small town called Fredonia, which is not far from the Georgia state line. This isn't something I personally experienced, but several people I knew growing up told me about Pigman, and a few people even saw him. Pigman was mostly seen around this area a mile from where I grew up called Smedley Road, which is rumored to be a place of some demonic things happening, murders, and other rumors back in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s mostly. A family friend of mine growing up, a guy named Terry, he told me that when he and some friends back in the 70s were hanging out, they saw a, a guy with a pig mask on and he immediately began chasing after them. He said that they had just enough time to get in his car and peel out of there as fast as possible to avoid whatever fate awaited them. He said that this pig man guy had long, sharp claws and that he or it left deep claw marks in the back of his car. I wish I could have seen this car, but this was long before I was born. He never went back to that area ever again because it scared him and his friends so bad. He always told me about the story with absolute conviction, and that he always he always got goosebumps on his arms when he would talk about it. But was Pigman an actual cryptid, or was he just some deranged lunatic with a mask? We may never know, but this was a relatively known thing that I heard several people talk about when I was a kid, and it always really creeped me out, and it prevented me from exploring that area. But eventually, after I got a four-wheeler when I was about 14, I did drive down there, but but of course, I never ventured off the main path. But who knows, maybe Pigman was a property owner coming up with a creative way to scare away trespassers. (laughs) But anyway, that's all I have to say on the subject, and I always wanted to call and tell you about it. But anyway, I'm a huge fan of the show and a Patreon member, and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Cody. Now, you know I've played several Pigman stories on these Hometown Legend episodes, but I believe this is the first to come out of the state of Alabama. And quite the tale, it was. As if the concept of Pigman wasn't terrifying enough. This one has to have long, gnarly claws. Now, I always wondered if we pitted these animal hybrids against each other. Royal Rumble style. Who would come out on top? Pig man, goat man, dog man, mantis man. Hell, we can even throw shadow man into the mix for a little dramatic flair. Tell me, who do you got? And thank you again, Cody, for helping us to spread the pig man's natural range. 
Well, this next one takes us off the beaten path to the dusty hills and valleys of East Central Nevada. Kenny, welcome to tonight's special episode. Hi, Derek. My name's Kenny. I live in a town in the middle of Nevada called Ely, E-L-Y, kind of like a town in Minnesota. This is a submission for the hometown legends. And mind you, I'm still kind of new to the podcast. I'm catching up as best I can, but... One legend that I don't think I've heard yet that I feel like is either way bigger than I think it is or way smaller than I feel it should be is the ghost train in Ely. Now, people who watch the Big Bang Theory have in passing heard of the ghost train. There was a whole episode where they talked about going to Ely and enjoying the, the train itself. It's one of the oldest running steam engines in the country or whatever. But the ghost train has more ghost stories than I can count. There's the gentleman, he got locked up between two cars, and he died when they separated him. So before they separated him, his family got to say goodbye. It also passes right past the Desperation Mine, and the little town just outside of that my dad is going to slap me upside the head, I don't remember the name for. But I've been out there, and it is rightly creepy. Along with this comes the fact that there is an old train maintenance man who patrols the yard at night who I've actually seen. The long and short of it is, is my fiance and I were playing cat and mouse with some of her friends, and I had a four-wheel drive and her friends didn't, so I, I like to cheat. <laughs> Basically, we were cutting across the railroad tracks and we saw a man holding a lantern. Now, the gentleman who walks the yard at night, still, even still to this day, he holds the lantern. And I panicked and I saw him walking toward the car, so I saw the car and I opened the door, and as soon as I opened the door, it was like in a ra- like a dry erase eraser. I stepped out, my eyes crossed my A pillar, and he disappeared in that distance. It, it was wild to me. I really love the podcast. It helps me through my graveyard shifts, which I'm actually calling during currently. And all you got to do is just look up Ghost Train of Ely, and I can guarantee you'll be able to find way more than I can say in just five to even ten minutes, or probably even more than I've ever heard of. So... Thank you very much. You have a good day. Thank you, Kenny. Ely, Nevada. Talk about the middle of nowhere. You guys are certainly remote out there. And you know, Kenny is right. If you search Ely Ghost Train, you'll get all sorts of first-hand accounts and long-believed legends. But one place that Kenny failed to mention that also adds a ton of lore is the Ely Engine House there in town. And we managed to find a short tour on the Engine House online. I posted it up in the show notes. But here is an example of the sort of activity that's been reported in and around that building the past century or so. A few years ago, many, many years ago, a kid growing up next door noticed that the back door of the Engine House had been left open accidentally. He got his friends together, and what better thing to do at a sleepover than to come into the old engine house and try to find something. They made their way through the back room all the way up to the center of the room right here. When they got to this point, a railroad worker appeared between the two locomotives, just the top half of him, and shouted at him, What are you doing here? Those kids ran out of here, and to this day, the kid that brought everybody else in here will not come into the engine house after dark with the lights off, and he's now a grown adult. Now that clip courtesy of the Nevada Northern Railway Facebook page. And go check out the rest of the video. The guide there tells us several stories about the engine house and the rail line itself. And you get the tour for free. And we thank you again, Kenny, for bringing this to us. I don't know if I'll ever make it up that way. But if I do... I'll be watching the rails, for sure. Well, kids, that brings us awfully close to the end of not only this Hometown Legends special episode, but season 16 as a whole. And before I push play on this final entry, I want to thank you all for another amazing season. Whether you called in, 
bought merchandise. Join the Patreon and or just tune in each week. Your continued support is appreciated and does not go unnoticed. So from me and the rest of the Monsters Among Us crew, thank you. Now, of course, we will be back next season with a hopefully bigger and better product. But I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone for getting us this far. Now, on to the last call of the evening. And it involves one of the biggest hometown legends out there. Please join me in welcoming Mike from Texas to tonight's special program. Hey, Derek, this is Mike from Dallas. I was listening to your most recent episode for Calls for Hometown Legends, and uh, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and I was in Phoenix during the Phoenix Lights. I'm sure this subject has been covered ad nauseum, but I got a pretty decent look at it. I was only like a few miles away from where it sort of drifted over. And I'll just say the official explanation that these were flares dropped from Luke Air Force Base is total BS, because like those lights started way in the north up near, I want to say, kind of like Camp Verde area, which is a good hour or so north of Phoenix. And it came all the way down and passed over the city real slow at a steady altitude. And I remember it passing over me a few miles. And it was dark, but you could faintly make out the shape of something. Like, it was blocking out the stars and whatnot. So they weren't just individual lights. There was actually a structure to it. I was 15 at the time. And my mother was with me. She was driving, and we saw it. We pulled over, and we were like, what in the F is that? <laughs> like, it was completely silent. The lights were kind of just steady, a little bit of a, like, a skip, but not much. Definitely not a flare. I mean, later in my life, I lived out, like, two miles from the Air Force Base. And then I've also lived near uh, their training areas. I've seen flares. They didn't look anything like that. Again, you know, I know this subject's been covered ad nauseum, but I figured I'd give you a call and maybe give you some content for your hometown legends. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Mike, for calling in. Now here's the deal with the Phoenix lights. There were actually two flaps that evening. For a little context and to clear up the timeline, please focus your attention on this clip from the 1990s documentary UFOs Over Phoenix, Anatomy of a Sighting. On the night of March 13, 1997, there were two separate incidents involving unidentified flying objects in the Phoenix, Arizona area. The first event occurred between 8.15 and 8.45 p.m. The second, just after 10 p.m. The first event involved a V-shaped object first spotted near the town of Paulden. It traveled on a southeasterly course passing over Phoenix at about 8.30 p.m. Just after 8.45 p.m., the V-shaped object turned and disappeared somewhere northwest of Arizona, near Kingman. Although seen by hundreds of people throughout Arizona, only one known videotape exists of this phenomenon. It was captured on tape by a retired pilot from the front yard of his home in Scottsdale, north of Phoenix. Although Terry was the only eyewitness to actually record the mysterious V-shaped object on videotape, many other people throughout Arizona reported seeing the UFO that evening. Just 90 minutes after the light formation abruptly disappeared, Terry's camera captured a second pattern of strange lights hanging in the dark skies over Phoenix. The major significance of this 10 p.m. event is that these lights visible throughout the Phoenix area were recorded on videotape by at least four witnesses. So for those of you out there that just see the one video, the second video recorded, a clip that to me looks an awful lot like flares being dropped from a plane. In actuality, that event came hours after the first sighting, which leaves many to believe that the military quickly scrambled a plane into the sky, strategically placed it over the city, where most will see it, then proceeded to drop flares in a boomerang shape. It's assumed they did so just to cloud the intel. And I can get on board with that theory. Something either from our military or somewhere else ripped through central Arizona. Thousands of people saw it. Hundreds of people reported it. And one man got it on video. 
So what a better way to discredit such a sighting than to do it all over again using flares. Now this event took place 27 years ago this month, but we're still no closer to any answers. But there is some solace in knowing that since that infamous mass sighting, hundreds and even thousands have seen something similar in the skies all over our planet. So at the very least, Phoenix, you guys weren't the only ones. So we thank you again, Mike, for sharing that hometown legend. And a big thanks to everyone else that took the time to share their local tales. Now don't forget, this is the end of Season 16. But there will be new content posted each week until we return with Season 17 in late April. So be sure to check back every Thursday. I plan on unlocking a few more Beyond episodes, and even bringing in a guest or two to share some stories with. So hopefully, I will see you there. Now, Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Copyright Red Crow Media. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Bowers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And if you will, do me a solid and follow us over on social media. And while you're at it, leave us a rate and review and like and follow at YouTube as well. Don't forget, you can catch the show every Saturday evening at 11 p.m. Eastern on the UnX Network. Just visit unxnetwork.com to tune in. And finally, tonight's score was provided by Armchair Ambiance, Co.ag Music, and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you for an incredible season. And I'll catch you guys in a couple of weeks. Have a good night. Now this season's final secret call comes to us from the Commonwealth of Virginia and covers one of my all-time favorite paranormal subjects. Please welcome Jim to the program. Hey Derek, this is Jim calling from Henrico, Virginia for the Hometown Legends special. The story I have is about a wolfman or dogman, werewolf, whatever you want to call it, and the lore on it dates back to all the way back with the, uh, the Civil War. The Civil War is pretty heavily fought in Virginia, since we're like the most northern state in the south. So a lot of the legends and folklore around here relate to that in some sort of way. The story goes that during the Civil War, a soldier died and his spirit since then sort of manifested into this dog-like creature in Henrico County. Specifically, it's supposed to be at this uh, recreation area, kind of a park called the Spring Hill Recreation Area people claiming to, to hear howling at night as opposed to like actually seeing something. Uh, however, sightings do like exist. The ones I could find said that it was like six feet tall uh, and it would run around on all four legs before out of nowhere, just kind of unexpectedly popping up on two and taking off. Uh, color-wise, it was supposed to be a darker, like blacker gray sort of creature with bits of white on the tips of its hair. Uh, people said that looked very wolf-like, very canine. Some people just said werewolf. Other people are saying dog man, something along those lines. One of the sightings I came across while researching all this again to sort of refresh my memory was from a couple who said that they were out at the park at night and were sitting on a bench and heard some howls from behind them. They turned around and saw two uh, white wolves staring them down from a, a ways off until a car came by and scared them away. 
they said the stare down lasted for like 10-ish minutes, something like that. So they, they would have had time to get a, a good look at it, you know. Uh, one other person I, I saw uh, claimed that they were, were stalked by it. They hadn't even noticed it and it was sort of following them until at some point they turned around and saw it peering out of a, a shadow. It got scared and took off. Sightings uh, really began in the, the early 2000s-ish era. So, you know, I, I would take it all with a, a grain of salt being that it's so recent and uh, and whatnot. But it's still fun to sort of have those like local lore and all that. Uh, anyways, I love the podcast. It's been really helpful for background noise while I'm studying or driving. And hopefully you can use this for the upcoming special. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the entry. Oh, man. This sounds like the kind of movie I would have rented on repeat somewhere in the late 80s. A Civil War werewolf. Who am I kidding? I'd watch that movie still today. Now, werewolves in Virginia. Not exactly my specialty, but I do know there have been a handful of sightings reported there over the years. Henrico County seems to be one of the hot spots, as Jim had mentioned. So I dug back as far as I could, and I managed to find a similar story from this area. A run-in with a beast all the way back in the early 1900s. The following was published on February 18th of 1902 in the Richmond Dispatch. Perhaps it may be another Hanover lion. About 10 or 15 years ago, the people of Hanover and Henrico living between Atley Station and the Broad Street Road, were in a tumult of excitement and dread by reason of a widely circulated report that a lion or tiger had escaped from a menagerie and was prowling through the country. Several reliable gentlemen informed the newspapers that they themselves had seen the great, ferocious beast. His tracks were measured and were shown to be enormously large. The people soon rose in arms against the invader, and he was killed one night in a carriage house or stable where he had taken shelter. The gentlemen who discovered his hiding place poked their guns through knot holes or cracks in the planks and fired a volley at him with deadly effect. There was some dispute as to whether he was a lion or a tiger, but in the course of inquest, it was discovered that it was a huge mastiff a dog not as common in these parts as now. It further appeared that the dog in question belonged to a foreign gentleman who was visiting these parts, and who was at that very moment diligently searching for his missing and much-loved Mastiff, and whose imprecations upon a people who did not know how to distinguish between a lion and a dog were both loud and deep. Now, it's worth noting that I found the article in the book Monsters in Print by author and friend of the show, Adam Benedict. It's an excellent resource for old-timey paranormal encounters. Now, whether or not the werewolf of Virginia exists, I have no doubt that this story with the Mastiff helped keep that legend of the Henrico werewolf alive. It's terrible that a man's pet was gunned down, though. I'll admit, it's not the brightest of notes to end the season on. But that's how these hometown legends go. A good many of them are born of tragedy. And there's no getting around that. So thank you again, Jim, for sharing that entry. You put a new Dogman legend on my map, and for that, I am thankful. All right, folks, there is no new Beyond episode this week, but check back in the next couple of weeks and I'll get something posted up for you. I just got some interesting information about the location of the Moose Lady sighting. So I'm hoping to do a deep dive on that soon. Until then, thank you all one last time. Keep it spooky and have a good night. Oh, and go watch the movie, BorregoTriangle.com.
Oh, uh, just one more thing. This weekend, the show will celebrate its eighth anniversary. Happy birthday, MAU. And as a token of our appreciation of the last eight years, I have one more story to share with you tonight. Now, it's not a hometown legend, but I do think that it's quite fitting, given that the show began on St. Patrick's Day. So what a better way to celebrate than with Rich's call out of the state of New Jersey. Hello, my name is Rich. I live in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and I showed this photo to lots of people, and I I can't believe it uh, when they see the picture. I sent a photo of it to what they call the paranormal store in Hasbury Park, New Jersey. They, they couldn't believe the picture, and uh, I'd like to send you the picture. So give me a telephone number I can send it to. I was walking my dog uh, in the springtime, and uh, I took a picture of this herd of deer, and uh, I enlarged it so I could see the deer better, and huh, floating over top of them, it looks like a, a, a little leprechaun. So I'll send you a picture of it, and you decide for yourself. Everybody that's seen it can't believe it, and I still can't believe it, but it's there. I thank you, and have a good day. Thank you, Rich. And yes, please, please send us that picture because I think we all need to lay eyes on it. Now, I did reach out to Rich in hopes that he would forward the photo, but as of the time of this recording, he has not yet done so. But check those show notes. Once I do have it, I'll post it right away. So please, Rich, let us have a look. Alright folks, that's going to do it for real. The killer is really dead this time. So you can go home now. Go on. Have a good night.